Welcome to Spotlight on Urban Tech in Europe, the virtual series, webinar dated 9th of July 2020, entitled Smart Cities, Urban Tech Solutions to Shorten the Road to Recovery. You will be hearing from our expert panellists, including CEO of Midas, representing the City of Manchester in the UK, Head of Digitalisation, Innovation and Investments for Innovative Sofia, on behalf of the City of Sofia, Bulgaria, our business representative in real estate, Director of Avis and Young, and our academic, President of the National Institute of Research in Urban Management. Welcome everybody, first of all. Um, I represent uh, Sea Intelligence, and Sea Intelligence and Four Global have uh, brought this project together with some of our independent advisors. Uh, we started the project in order to um, look at connections between uh, cities, connections between uh, businesses and cities, and also the academic community in order to drive innovation and change and open up new opportunities. Um, what is it? It's a series of webinars, executive summaries, um, which will come a, culminate in a report and an event at the end of all of this. Um, I'll explain in a little more detail again uh, for people at the end who haven't joined us yet. Um, there will be a survey that people can sign up to and if you go onto urbantech.world then you can see all of the details of what exactly the whole project involves. Um, but I'll hand over now um, to Pascal who can explain specifically about the webinar. We've still got quite a few people to join uh, at the moment so um, we will sum this up later as well. Over to you Pascal. <laughs> okay, thank you Christina. Hello everybody, welcome to this live website, uh, webinar of Spotlight on Urban Tech in Europe. My name is Pascal Bleuker, I'm the co-founder for Global and passionate about technology in cities. Uh, technologies are rapidly changing our lives and societies every day and everywhere. And uh, in this webinar, we have an amazing group of experts who share with us their insights how urban technologies can shorten their roads to recovery. In times like these, it is even more important that we can learn from each other to future-proof our cities, companies, and lives. And to keep a profound perspective, we have experts from the cities of Manchester and Sofia, uh, the real estate company Avis and Young, and we have also the science perspective brought in by Inregu. Uh, the webinar will follow a logical order, so we will start with what we encounter today and the challenges that we have. And then we also dive into the opportunities which are also there. If you have a question for our panel, please share with me via the chat functionality, as we have a webinar with the Q&A in the end. Uh, and the webinar will take approximately 45 minutes and will be moderated by uh, Zach Messian. Uh, yeah, and now without further ado, let me give the floor to our panelists who are most important and who will briefly introduce himself. And uh, yeah, can I start with you, Tim? Uh, yes, thanks, Pascal. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Nunes. I'm Chief Executive of Midas, which is uh, Greater Manchester's uh, inward investment agency. So uh, our role is to attract investment uh, from across the world into Greater Manchester, uh, which we do in, in most of our sort of four key sectors. So uh, very much an integrated role within the local government here, but very business facing at the same time as well. Thank you, Tim. Can we continue with you, Nadia? Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Nadia. I'm the head of the newly formed department at Sofia Municipality dealing with digitalization, innovation, and economic development uh, just since January this year. And uh, actually, the last four years, I was the head of the team uh, doing um, the Invest Sofia agency. Uh, so we were dealing with uh, what team just described inward innovation. Uh, investments and uh, branding the city as a tech hub. All right, welcome on the panel. Paul, could you introduce yourself? So good afternoon, I'm Paul Caligrover. I'm a director at Avis & Young. Um, Avis & Young's the world's fastest growing real estate um, services firm operating in the UK, Europe, United States and Canada. Um, I focus on strategic development management for clients in the UK. I'm also one of the UK government's uh, export champions and working with the government on the Northern Powerhouse Initiative. Good to have you on board, Paul. Philip, could you also introduce yourself? Yes, uh, welcome everyone. Um, uh, I'm the president of INREGU. It is the National Institute of Research in Urban Management, which is located in Lyon. 
uh, we provide research analysis and executive education on urban management in future cities. We work on data analysis and deep learning in the urban environment for small cities and virtual cities. Good to have you on board as well. Yeah, Zach, can I hand it over to you to moderate further on? Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. My name is Zach Merzian. I'm an organizational agility coach and consultant. Um, effectively, I help organizations who are currently operating in rapidly uh, moving and changing environments to increase their ability to respond to opportunities and challenges quickly and effectively. Uh, most importantly for today, I am your moderator and I would like to start straight away with the lovely panel. I've got a few questions here, um, starting with the first one, which is pretty much anchored in the present. And, um, you know, with the impact of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we'd like to think about what the, that has meant for cities, and the two cities that are present here in terms of the impact on the urban tech initiatives that either they had or they're having at the moment. And I would like to hand over to either Nadia or, or Tim. Um, do, shall I uh, shall I kick off? Um, it's, uh, I should say ladies first, but I think I think the order was going to be me first. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Nadia, um, apologies for my lack of chivalry. Um, but uh, I think first of all, just just to start off a little window as to what happened before COVID. So. Uh, Manchester, in the latest Tech UK report, which is one of the UK, uh, you know, largest UK reports on on the tech community, uh, ranked Manchester as the the fastest growing tech cluster in Europe. So pre-COVID, there was a huge positive dynamic really in the city, uh, particularly around sectors like e-commerce and cybersecurity that was seeing significant growth, as well as the overall uh, software development piece as well. And uh, again, it's something that's quite rooted in the surrounding areas as well. So uh, one of our other panellists you know, uh, is in Liverpool, again, seen a lot of growth in those areas as well. So something that very much uh, is, is in that area around Manchester as well. So that, that was the pre-COVID position. I think we've seen a real mixed uh, piece, really, in terms of uh, over the last three months in particular, from some of our industries like e-commerce, uh, performing incredibly well as the huge switch to digital has meant that those companies have been incredibly successful over the last three months. But then also some of our, even within the e-commerce sector, some of our e-commerce businesses that work in the travel industry have obviously been hit very hard um, by the the complete sort of, um, well, drop off of uh, international travel and uh, tourism. So, so a contrasting piece really some of our very small businesses have been heavily, heavily affected by uh, the crisis as well as people have had to self-isolate and, and been affected in that respect. Um, but we've also had some of the government initiatives coming in, the furloughing schemes, which they've taken advantage of, and also uh, a, a much broader range of initiatives as well to support businesses that have come in in terms of COVID loans and all those types of programs. So there's been emergency actions, both by central government and local government, uh, to try and help the industry locally, uh, as well as, uh, as I say, the, some of the impacts of, um, of COVID actually uh, bringing growth to the sector, particularly, as I say, e-commerce and cybersecurity. What I wanted to talk about a little bit was just uh, what we've done more in the smart city side of things as well, actually, and very much driven by COVID. Um, we, we already had, to an extent, an integrated patient care record within our health service locally. Um, but what's happened during COVID is um, we've managed to get over some of the hurdles that existed really um, before COVID started. And in particular, barriers around data sharing amongst our private, uh, primary and secondary care um, institutions and how we actually share data across both hospital trusts, local, local government, and also other independent organisations as well. And I think what we've seen is that through the emergency situation, we've actually been able to overcome some of those government issues um, and create some very forward thinking uh, and I think game changing opportunities really for, for Greater Manchester. So the, the integrated patient care record or the inter integrated care record, it's called the ICR, um, shares important information uh, about uh, everything that you are experiencing as an individual. So whether it be uh, current health issues, medications that you're taking, allergies, all your historic patient records. 
Um, but importantly, I think the difference with this is it covers the whole 3.3 million population of Manchester now, uh, which it didn't pre-COVID. So it covered about 2 million people before COVID. It now covers three, almost 3.5 million people. And it shares records across primary care, secondary care, community services, uh, social care in terms of mental health services as well. So that every touch point that an individual will come into contact with uh, it, from a health perspective, it now shares on a single system. And that has been a massive, massive step forward that the emergency situation has driven us into really and allowed us to undertake. So I think um, that is a big change that we've seen driven by COVID. Um, hopefully an opportunity for us as a city going forward to share that now with industry and see what we can do with that information. Um, and likewise, transfer that into other initiatives such as the current complex contact tracing app that we're just about to launch as well. So I'll leave it there uh, and hand over to, to Nadia, but hopefully that's one, one example that will mean, mean something to people at the moment. Thank you very much, Tim. You really painted a, a vivid picture there of the, uh, the challenges and the opportunities and the ability to pivot and um, play to the advantage of, of the situation. Uh, Nadia, your perspective from Sophia's uh, point of view? Sure. If I have to follow the same, the same steps as Tim did, uh, let me describe briefly what Sophia was like uh, before COVID. Uh, we were uh, pretty much establishing as a tech hub in the region and beyond, I should say, uh, with lots of tech events, lots of uh, product development happening in the, in the city, lots of startups, lots of financing, uh, all sorts of good stuff happening here, but which we were very proud of and still are. Uh, and uh, especially in the areas like finance, uh, lately Sofia became a hub for AI, uh, autonomous driving and uh, lots of products, really innovative products happening here. We as a city, uh, when we started working on, uh, on our digital strategy and our digital plan of what we're going to do, uh, sort of analyzed the economy of Sofia and uh, realize that close to 20% of what we produce here is IT related. Uh, lots of great, great products, including, including smart city products, products that can be used for cities, were being developed here. And for some reason, we were not using them. They were, they were developed for cities like Copenhagen and, and you name it. Uh, so uh, we were in a position in which our citizens are, our citizens were coding those amazing things, but we were not using them. So the city um, developed a digital transformation strategy in order to meet and to be the, the client number one, the test bed, the, the, the user actually of, of those products. Uh, and uh, we were just starting to do that. As I said, our unit was formed uh, in January, so we had two months of normal work and then several months of COVID work. Uh, if that's the new normal, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, basically, um, this is what we are. This is what we are trying to do: meet meet the high-level products that we are producing here in the city with the in using them. Uh, now with COVID, of course, uh, we have um, issues uh, in terms of. Um, income the city is suffering because we lost a lot of money and things uh, from things like transport and things like parking so the budget is suffering uh luckily uh, that probably won't affect any uh, digital and smart city projects because uh, now after COVID, we know those are important so that's my uh thank you very much <laughs> Matt. yeah and i think it's it's great to see some common themes across the cities um even pre and post um the actual um, pandemic as well. I think that's probably the, the great work that was done by uh, Four Global and, and C Intelligence in, in terms of gathering this panel. So moving to the next question, really, I want to I want to bring think about the aspect of the uh, the um, the urban tech, um, uh, if you will. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm looking for the word is um, the ecosystem that you operate in, um, which is the cities, the businesses, and, and the academics as well. And as we, uh, what, what COVID-19 really has, has, has uh, brought to the front is um, the importance of sometimes moving away from that long-term five-year planning approach to a more short-term, rapid, you know, crisis response. 
And I'm just wondering what the impact that has been on the, um, the, actual, the, 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 the ecosystem that you find uh, yourselves in. And I want to uh, start with Paul here just to um, ask you to, bring, to give us your perspective from a, the business side. Yep. Thank you, Zach. So um, I think even before the virus outbreak, we we're already starting to see behavioural shifts in business, shopping online, working from home. And those sort of changes were starting to challenge the more traditional real estate models. Um, but what COVID-19 and enforced social distancing has really done is accelerated the speed at which that change has been taking place. So even before the um, it can, uh, the epidemic is over, it's likely that we're going to see um, an element of social distancing continuing, at least for the foreseeable future. Um, and in response to the pandemic itself, we've seen a rapid move and adoption of digital and online tools for remote working, as well as accessing entertainment, sharing of data. And, and this really does have the potential for long lasting impacts on real estate, both in terms of how we design, build, operate and use the buildings and cities in, in which we're based. Um, as we come out of COVID, we're all asking ourselves questions about the need to travel, the need to meet, the need to go to places for entertainment. We've got used to doing things over the last three months that have challenged how we've done things before. So are things going to return to um, pre-COVID levels? Probably unlikely. And before the pandemic, we were already seeing challenges across parts of the real estate sector, and most notably in our high streets and, and other elements. And we think that we're going to see that continuing. And But what we're going to see is um, more adaptation and use of technology to help us move forward and move forward at pace as we come out of COVID. Any examples of such technologies? Yeah, so we're, so we're using technologies at the moment, working very closely um, with uh, for the delivery of schemes effectively, working as we move into a, into a period where, um, say, local planning authorities are having to work through virtual um, uh, decisions for making um, uh, bringing projects forward. So that's required a, a, a new way and a quicker way of working with data, augmented reality, working with how schemes can look and will look within the environments in which they're going to be delivered. So that means focusing now on how quickly we can bring projects forward and, and help people understand how they're going to look, how they're going to operate and how they're going to um, exist within real space. But we're having to do that now within a virtual environment and moving things forward in a, in a shared technology, which again is challenging how we can share data, how we can look at information and how we can bring people together to actually collaboratively work on the delivery of major projects. Thank you very much, Paul. Paul a great perspective from, uh, from, from the business that's quite aligned with what uh, Tim and, and, and Nadia were saying earlier. And I think this is an opportunity to uh, bring uh, Dr. Philippe here. Um, from, a, from an academic perspective, have you seen an increase in the level of, uh, of collaboration within the ecosystem? Uh, so when uh, when all this started, you know, we, we, we've seen, we've observed that the cities were doing actually, their, their, they were very good in their response and uh, they responded actually very fast. But what was uh, more uh, interesting was with all the technology actually that uh, we have, what did go wrong? You know, that something went wrong in this uh, story because there is a misalignment between our expertise and monitoring of pandemics of uh, all these uh, uh, virus attacks uh, and our response to, to the COVID. So in, uh, you know, this expertise, we are excellent. We are monitoring um, the bats, we are monitoring uh, the, the birds, the camels. We know all the virus, we are uh, assessing all these uh, viruses. And with all this information, which is recorded, so even in the case of the COVID-19, we had the virus, it was identified, it was recorded, assessed, and the level was, uh, was here. And then there is this misalignment between the information we had in the academic world, in the science world, and what we, how we responded, actually. So this situation was neither unprecedented nor unpredictable, and even some investors, you know, were waiting and ready for it. So the information was here, but we were not able to identify the threat and revise the risk. So what did happen? 
information got lost, we had the information, and the risk of pandemic was ignored and under, underestimated. And that means there is uh, not enough collaboration, maybe, between the science and the knowledge that we have and the rest of the, um, the cities, maybe. And, and is that changing, Dr. Philippe? Are you seeing now people realizing the importance of that collaboration? We, we understand that we actually need to correlate better the information because it was not the, uh, having the information was not enough to, collabor to correlate this one with what happens in the city. Not enough. So we, because the city, and I think we, we may open that subject later, is a systemic environment. And we start to understand that when something is happening in one part of the city, it has an impact in other systems of the city. And this is what this pandemic has actually uh, is, is teaching us, is that the city is a complex environment of systems of systems. And this is opening uh, maybe the discussion even more. We did not connect enough dots to make this reveal as a, a real threat in that case. But now we know that we need to open more dots, more information, and this is where artificial intelligence, deep learning, I think, uh, will pave a new way in the, in the urban environment. Thank you very much, Dr. Philippe. So, um, thinking again about the ecosystem really quickly, maybe in two or three sentences, um, from your perspective, Nadia and Tim, I'll start with you, Nadia. Are you seeing more collaboration in Sofia within the, the ecosystem? Definitely. And uh, the collaboration, like what we plan to do and how to approach companies and startups and, and, and universities in order to collaborate over a month and years actually happened overnight during COVID. It was like, uh, like that, literally. And uh, uh, companies are calling us to offer solutions uh, free of charge. And it was this, uh, this huge step forward happening literally overnight. Very glad. And I like that. The theme is acceleration, which I think Paul highlighted earlier, how COVID-19 accelerated certain aspects of, of, of collaboration and response. And Tim, from your perspective, anything to add? Yeah, complete agreement, really. I mean, as you say, the key has been the acceleration, really. I think the the big thing, the collaboration, absolutely there. And I mean, the contact uh, tracing app uh, platform that I mentioned before has been developed with one of our local firms, ANS, and uh, also Microsoft as well. So sort of leveraging both the sort of large global and the local, but with the local government and the local, you know, the place, if you like, behind it in terms of, uh, the data that's available to us uh, as the sort of glue in all of that. So I think uh, a really good collaborative um, example, really, but at speed. And that that is the other thing that I think has blown us away over the last two or three months, just how fast some of these things have been developed and, and brought to market. Uh, likewise, another one of our companies, VST Enterprises, that developed a health passport as well. Again, you know, for the current environment brought to market very, very quickly with support. So I think that's, that's been the big, big change for us and very exciting. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, I think uh, the next place to go in terms of um, what we'd like to explore really is, um, if you think about the last few months, I mean, the, the, the constant theme has been whether it is governments or organizations, companies or, or, or cities, finding that right balance between public health and then economic and, and social recovery. And the question is, how can smart cities help, can it, you know, really shorten the road to recovery? And I would like to start with, I don't know who, um, probably start with you, um, Nadia. Uh, sure. Uh, for us, it's been a back and forth game. We've initially released the, the restrictions and now uh, just today we announced we are um, tightening them up again because we have a spike in, in, in cases. Uh, so it's really a back and forth uh, that uh, poses a challenge because some people do not understand the logic behind that. They're just looking for this end date. It's like when everything is going to be over, you said it's going to be on Saturday, but whoa, now you're doing something different. You're not consistent as a government. Uh, so uh, it's, as I said, back and forth. It's an everyday change uh, 
can uh, smart cities change that? Of course, and, and facilitate that, of course, because the more data we have, the better decisions we'll be making. Uh, and um, I agree with, with Philippe that uh, we have uh, all that information that the city is collecting and uh, it's scattered all over the place. We haven't been very uh, good at collecting it, analyzing it and making decisions based on it. And that's few of the projects we're working on currently here in Sofia. Uh, and uh, that will help probably not in the next uh, year or so, but in the long run, definitely that's the direction we need to be going if we want to solve future crises like that, health or not health, you name it. You need to have the data, you need to localize the problem uh, instead of um, shutting down the entire city, which economically is not very good. Thank you. Thank you, Nada. I like the, uh, the, the specific mention of uh, the importance of data to make better more informed, better decisions. Quicker decision, I suppose, um, going back to the point about acceleration earlier. Um, maybe, Tim, your perspective from Manchester? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we're concentrating and, and I'm sure like Nadia and Sophia, you know, we're a city that's used to having a very vibrant, uh, vibrant society, really. You know, it's a city renowned for nightlife, um, which is, uh, and, and likewise, I'm sure Paul will say the same about Liverpool as well. You know, again, huge tourism city as well. So. Um, so, you know, it's a big challenge to keep people um, in lockdown and then release people gradually. Obviously, we are, some of our restrictions have just been released over the last week or so. Um, I think that's why we're putting so much attention into this complex contact tracing uh, piece of work at the moment, which, as I say, goes live imminently. Uh, because exactly what Nadia said, really, that will allow us to really understand exactly where pockets of um, the, the virus uh, remain, uh, where there might be spikes, and be able to restrict those very quickly into those very small areas of the city region. And I think that's the absolute key, that we don't have to shut down the whole place uh, in order to um, you know, essentially restrain the virus uh, within our area. Because obviously the impact of this, particularly for cities that are used to, um, if you like, the nighttime economy, the uh, you know, the hospitality industry being being a big part of the, the city region, then again, we need to retain and maintain those industries as best we can at this current period of time as they're just opening. Uh, and I think, as I say, gathering that data through the contact tracing um, exercise that we're starting will be an absolutely critical component in that. Thank you, Tim. And you're adding a perspective there, which is a, a good decision is a targeted decision. I think that's a, that's a vital point you're making there. Um, from, from your perspective, Paul, and from a business side, where, how can a smart city help shorten that road to recover? Because there's lots of challenges for businesses, even if it's going back, do we ever, when will we come back to the office? Yeah, so that, that, that's been a, a key question uh, for us in terms of a number of our clients looking to uh, looking at ways to open back up, but open back up safely, which, which, as you say, is fundamental. And that's about, you know, we're working with a number of our clients in terms of their return to the office, how we can use technology in that office space to make sure it's the most safe environment in which people to return. So that's not just obviously the office you're working in, that's the whole environment, the whole building, the whole landscape around it sit, uh, around which it sits. Something else we've also seen, which I think again, picks up on this whole collaboration point and, and, and echoes what Tim was saying, and I've, I've seen in, in, in Liverpool where I'm, I'm, I'm currently based, we've seen the city working together with uh, retailers, with businesses, um, using technology, using loans to enable people to get to a position where they can deliver um, uh, automated payments, so, you know, card payments, the sort of cashless society that, that we seem to be moving to. But also um, in, in Liverpool, they've had a, a project over the last couple of weeks called Without Walls, where effectively they are helping businesses fund outside seating areas to enable them to continue operating to increase the amount of covers that they have, given that they can't have as many covers inside. But at the same time, you're using that tracking app, as, as um, Tim was mentioning there, that you're recording people who are coming, you're booking. So, you know, these are technologies that we, I hope we will continue to use post-COVID that we can understand how people are going to visit spaces, how they're going to visit restaurants, how they're going to use places so that we can um, plan our, how businesses respond around that. Tim. Tim, was there something you want to add? Yeah, I was just going to say, and, and again, one of our, again, one of our local companies just, uh, you know, in terms of people who've taken 
advantage to accelerate their own business models. One, one of our local app companies here is Showcool, um, which again have specialized in you know, local independent shops that don't necessarily have an e-commerce platform or a delivery offer. Uh, I've been able to join that and very quickly deliver, you know, whilst people were in lockdown and not able to go into some of those shops or the restaurants, uh, you know, were effectively closed or for takeaway only in this country, you know, they were able to instantly join that on a very localized level. So not one of the large international global apps, but localized level and still serve that local community and stay alive essentially during that period. So, you know, it, you know, some of those sorts of commercial opportunities in the private sector have been really, really revolutionary as well and great to see. Thank you very much. I mean, these are all great examples of how the silver lining, if you will, in, in this, uh, amid this great tragedy, human and, and, and economic tragedy that is the, the COVID-19 pandemic, and how um, cities, businesses and, and, and organizations around the world alike have, are learning to make quick decisions, to experiment, to adapt, and that's bringing an element of agility um, to our cities and our businesses. And I think that's really important. I'd like to turn to you, uh, Dr. Philippe, and just thinking in terms of the latest thinking. I mean, so, uh, the panelists here have, um, other panelists here have highlighted some of the opportunities, such as um, we talked about um, on the in the MedTech side about the contact tracing apps, etc. cetera. From the, uh, in terms of the latest um, thought leadership, I'm, I'm looking at you for, for that. What other opportunities do you see really for a smart cities going forward? Well, now actually we need to be better informed. Uh, and we are facing a new challenge. So, and we, to face this new challenge, we won't use all the solutions. So, and we see that we need to have new data. To create this new data, we need actually to create new sensors. I'll give you an example. Um, nowadays, when we go to the companies, we have to take the temperature. What if, what if in each home, actually, we could take the temperature every time we go out of that home and that data, for example, is centralized. At the government level, at the nation level, national level, we could actually foresee something, you know, if there is a raise of temperature in a certain area, maybe in a cluster, we can identify clusters. So we have new questions, new questions. And to answer those questions, we need information. To have this information, we need to create those senses. So the future uh, to solve what we have is to innovate more based on the user case. So the fact now that we are in a smart city environment where everything can be connected very fast, you know, with these IoT devices, they can communicate with the 5G coming. Uh, this is really opening up a new era of innovation and anyone can innovate. So uh, saying, oh, this innovation is good or is this one, I think it's just an open blank page, you know, just have an idea. I've, I've mentioned the idea of the, the temperature, but uh, maybe in the, in the coming weeks, we are going to, we need another type of test. We need another type of information and we need to create the, the sensor and the system with it. Thank you, Dr. Philippe. And I think um, th there's a lot to be learned from other industries as well. I mean, what we're talking about here, there's an aspect of predictive analytics here. Um, and I know from my work with the insurance industry that some, some, some insurers, car insurance, for instance, would, would get data and tell them, oh, there's, a, there's something around theft of Range Rovers in such and such city, in such and such area that allows them to make a better decision when they write their, their premiums, for instance, for new business. So th th there is inspiration from, to be given from there. Any other examples of specifically short-term opportunities um, from other members of the panel? Nadia, something to add on that? I just wanted to reflect on what Philippe said uh, during the COVID crisis, the first month, uh, months we worked with the um, local robotics and automation association, really um, high-end companies uh, there. Uh, and uh, if I quote what they said, it's like uh, the technology for pretty much everything is there, expensive or not so. So the technology is there. It's making, uh, going over the legal, administrative, and even people hurdles to adopt it is, is the big, it's the big uh, challenge. 
So yes, you can measure people's temperature. Yes, you can put it on the cloud. Yes, you can analyze it, but then you, you go, um, you um, run into uh, data privacy issues. You run into who's managing that, who's owning the data, all those problems. So uh, yes, a lot of companies, uh, local companies approached us with some solutions like that. And uh, uh, unfortunately they didn't, they didn't get implemented because of privacy, uh, legal issues, and so on and so forth. So that's, for us, at least here in Sofia, that's the big challenge. The technology is there, but how to adopt it, how to make people use it. And if I might say something a little bit uh, different, but related, it's uh, how do you do it in, a, in an environment of very low, and this is a global issue, it's not just in Sofia, in a very low trust between the government. Yeah. So your government is telling you to install an app and to record your temperature. How are you going to do it? Do you trust those people? Do you trust the government? Maybe in Manchester you do, in Sofia less so. And, and globally, uh, trust in government is, is, is uh, decreasing. Uh, and then another issue also related to COVID is the issue of disinformation. Uh, a lot of the people and our, I think globally our COVID response has been... Um, Hurdled, uh, hindered by the the disinformation, a lot of our citizens, uh, especially this might be a specific problem for Bulgaria, but it's huge because people are really, really, really misinformed, uh, and there's all sorts of conspiracy theories going around, and it's just this is in the mainstream. This is not in some niche. Uh, Area. So can we use technology to solve that problem? Because that will solve many other problems by itself. Just a thought. Thank you, Nadia. I think there's a, so it's a great point you made there about trust. Um, collaboration to go back to accelerating. Do we have now a platform where there is a, a burning platform to actually have to collaborate across the, the, the legal side, the, 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 the government side, et cetera, to, to get the, through the red tape effectively? Um, and, and also misinformation. How can we how can we make sure that people get the right information? Um, Tim, your perspective from uh, from from Manchester. Yeah, I think I think a number of similarities with Nadia. Really, I think um, as I say that the 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 challenges still exist around things like information governance, um, and you know a lot of that obviously then goes into trust as well in terms of public use. Uh, as, as Nadia was saying, really, um, I think what what we've been able to um, we've known that in the past information governance has been an o maybe an overplayed concern by certain parties to not actually um, digitalize and, and open data and release data and integrate. Uh, and, and as I say, that's where COVID has been a, a great help in terms of forcing the issue of some of these things and uh, actually really making people come together. And as I say, the sort of uh, the integrated care record that I mentioned is an absolute example of that coming together and where we've been able to accelerate that debate around information governance and overcome some of that. But I think, you know, if you, if you look at that as an example and think, well, if we could apply that same acceleration across a range of different digital um, and smart city products, I mean, we could accelerate at such a pace as a place, um, but we know as COVID starts to gradually die down and people start to retrench, you know, possibly back to more traditional positions on some of the information governance piece, that that may start to become more difficult to, to make those strides in terms of integration and data use and data sharing that we've seen over the last three months in the emergency period. So I think, I think that information governance point and how we sort of retain the spirit of what we've seen during this last three, three or four months is really important in terms of getting the full benefit of um, of how we can actually use the data that we've got as our hands to, to make people's lives better, you know, locally here, and then use that as a commercial um, accelerant as well. That as you know, as we can develop a model here, as businesses can can develop models here, um, that they can use that, export that knowledge and, and those platforms into the global economy. Um, you know, to help change other cities as well. And likewise, hopefully we can benefit from the other cities and their companies that are doing similar as well. So I think 
I think information governance is still going to be a big challenge, but if we can get over it, then it's a huge opportunity if we can really get through into that data, the opening of data and that integration. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you. Great perspective. Um, last but not least, Paul, um, any short-term opportunities really uh, from a business perspective? Yeah, so we try to maintain to be best in class, and that means working with um, smaller startup businesses who can provide innovative, fast-thinking uh, responses to, to the property um, sector. I think one of the challenges that, that businesses will have going forward is the, the, the inability for collaboration. We're used to coming together, understanding, seeing things, attending technology fairs, understanding how things are coming forward. That can't happen at the moment. There's also the stop on, on, on students and you know, the, the ability for universities to be creating ideas and technologies. And, and I think that there's gonna be a lag as a result of that, but we should come out of this quicker and sort of leaner and looking at ways to work together um, and I think what we what we'll see then is the you know that that coming together of business to try and answer some of the questions that we've all been sitting pondering over whilst we've been in this sort of lockdown period about how can we return to a better environment a better city a better way of working and living and can technology effectively free us from some of the constraints that we had before and you know I, I mentioned before that that whole travel position you know we are all together now on this call talking with people around the world which we've been able to do for years but we've still over the last few years have physically have got together to do this so the question comes has there been a shift in how we're going to do business is there a shift in how we're now going to communicate and if we're communicating better and we're communicating quicker then we should be able to share ideas quicker and hopefully move businesses forward quicker that's what i'd like to believe thank you very much thank you such a such an inspiring and uh, positive uh, message there paul um pascal i'm looking at you i'm just thinking do we have time for maybe one or two questions from uh, from the audience yeah i think we do have time uh, i'm sorry to say also that it might be that we have a hiccup with the uh, chat functionality so that didn't came through but i did receive a question via email uh, let, let me push it forward. Uh, the question is actually, there's now being so much invested by the central governments, or even uh, spoken out, uh, investing billions um, for the coming time, also to improve uh, actually, well, lives of citizens, but also making it greener. Are there now any urban tech sectors actually being uh, supported in such a way by these major investments that actually? they can make full use of this COVID-19 period by the follow-up investments of central governments. Excellent. Pascal, who do you think we should open with? Uh, yeah, I think all four can have a very good <laughs> that's, that's, uh, Raise your hand if you fancy it first. So, uh, yeah, for me, it's Tim now. Tim, can you start? Do you think? Tim? Me, yeah. Um, so, I think... Um, I think public sector procurement is really important uh, in terms of kickstarting some of these things. So um, I think uh, in terms of, as I mentioned, in terms of some of the smart city technologies we're developing, I think trying to include some of our local companies very much in those exercises where there is being procured and developed and not only creating IP for them that they can then go on and export, but also you know, direct commercial proposition for them as well in the interim. So I think, um, you know, just some of the procurement as government looks to invest in infrastructure and new technologies to solve problems, et cetera, and focusing on how we can uh, deploy that, that uh, purchasing power, if you like, in our domestic. Thank you, Tim. But likewise, there's a huge amount of other support. So. Okay. Um, Dr. Philippe, maybe your perspective from, uh, mm -hmm. From the, the future state, the, 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 the thought leadership side? Um, so actually tomorrow I have a meeting in Lyon with the French tech. So uh, we are going actually to discuss uh, the new ideas of the, of the startups in Lyon related to the COVID-19. So it, we have this, uh, I will have better the data information tomorrow. But uh, when I looked at um, uh, the budget that the French government allocated uh, to the 
all the innovations, you know, in uh, early March when we went into the lockdown, then <laughs> the full budget, open budget was for innovation. But you don't press a button for innovation, you know, say, please innovate you just into, a, it's not easy. Uh, when I looked at all the subjects, I have, uh, they were mainly focused on medicine, on health care, but not that much on the smart city side of it on the management of the city. And uh, I am going to test actually with the city of Lyon uh, another idea uh, related to urban management, urban governance, and see actually how, what is the appetite. Uh, but in general, I have not seen in France, because that's where I was looking uh, for uh, during this uh, lockdown, um, major investment just for small cities to solve the issue of the, of the pandemic. Fantastic. I think um, we are starting to run out of time. If it's okay, I will just move to um, closing the, the the debate. I'm sure we could we could we could we could sit here and this is such a fantastic subject. I personally could sit here and listen to the panelists for another couple of hours. Unfortunately, um, we've got a, a time to to work towards. Just final comments in in two or three words from each um, one of you. What is the major take? away uh, for you from from today um, and I will go I'll start with potentially maybe Tim um, I, I think for me you know all the challenges we've had over the last few months it's it's just grabbing hold of those those one or two key positives like as I say you know streamlining information governance and and the use of data and using that really to accelerate uh, and build back stronger uh, as as a as a place, so that that's that's one of the biggest biggest opportunities for me over the next uh, you know few years really. Thank you very much, Tim and Nadia. From your perspective, uh, from our perspective, COVID has been yes a challenge, but also an opportunity because it really sped up the way the, the collaboration in the city with everybody, municipality, uh, businesses, universities. Uh, and I am very much hope that we will continue this post-COVID, whatever the new normal is, this will be the new normal for, for collaboration and for innovation, this openness and communication. Thank you, Nadia. Um, Paul, from, your, from the business side, from your perspective? Yes, yeah, so uh, four words, um, share data and collaborate. That's what we need to do. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Short and to the point, Paul. Um, Dr. Philippe? Last but not least. So from the, the, the lockdown uh, and reading of the documentations and, the, and the, do, the publications, I've seen that we are more and more understanding that we live in a systemic environment. It's not clear to, un to understand this definition. It's difficult to understand this definition, but we are getting more and more aware and mature in this systemic environment. Yes, of this systemic environment. Thank you very much. I think it's been an absolute privilege to moderate this discussion. I think we've got a couple of minutes to go before we finish. And I'd like to hand over to Christina, who has some very important uh, information about what happens next. <laughs> thank you, Zach. First of all, I'd just like to say thank you to all the panelists and to all, all the people who joined us today to listen in. Um, I found it very useful, certainly uh, to look out for our executive summary, which will come out next week. Uh, we obviously have limited time now, so the panellists all have the opportunity to then expand further on some of the questions that we've received and not been able to answer today as well. Um, and we will also expand on some of the key takeaways and uh, hopefully give you some additional insights as well. Um, if you'd like to view more information uh, about the project, you can go to urbantech.org. If you'd like to get involved, like our panellists here, then please get in touch as well and uh, we're open to uh, people getting involved in the survey which will come out uh, and be available for people to respond to in September October time. Our next webinar will be on the 10th of September and uh, details of that are on the website at the moment 